It is an honor to welcome Nadine Labaki and uh, <laughs> to, to be able to ask a few questions. Um, and then, of course, we'll take a few from you before you dash back to your televisions to see what's happening on election day. Um, while watching the film tonight for the second time, I thought of a beautiful line from François Truffaut, who, when he was first making The 400 Blows and then other films dealing with children, he said something like, working with a child who's on screen is fantastic because everything a child does, it's for the first time. That freshness and spontaneity. Um, did you feel that magical quality? Or were there times when you thought, what the hell did I get myself into to be working primarily with children who've never acted before? I um, mean, um, the second I, uh, I actually question I was asking myself every day, <laughs> every day when I was even writing, when we were writing the script. You know, we, are Im we were imagining these scenes with those kids and, and you have this vision of what this is going to be and you imagine it in your head. But still, I was thinking, what am I asking? I mean, this is going to be a mission impossible. I'm almost asking myself, this is the biggest challenge of my life. How am I going to get a boy who's almost one, almost walking, acting with, with another child who's 12, and, and making them do what I'm asking them to do in, when, uh, in my imagination? Uh, but, but there's somewhere, there's this faith that uh, is beyond anything, and that gives you the strength to just believe in what you're doing and say, I'm going to find those kids and I'm going to do, um, I'm going to make this dream become reality. And uh, when I was even asking, you know, the whole uh, team of casting, the, the casting uh, recruiters, uh, I, was, I was describing for them how Zayn should look and how Yona should look and, you know, telling them that Zayn should be a bit uh, smaller than his age because of malnutrition, that he has to have those you know, sad eyes that tell you that this kid has lived a lot, has been through a lot, has seen a lot. He's been a witness to a lot of things. This wisdom that uh, children that have suffered have, these children that have never been to school or, or that have been brought up on the streets, that have this, you know, um, kind of adulthood, that they're not children anymore. And all these, you know, all this description when I was talking to my casting crew, I was also saying to myself, I'm, I'm actually asking them a mission impossible. They're never, I'm asking a miracle from life. I'm never gonna be able to find those kids. And, I, and, and we found them. And we were able to, you know, to make this. Yeah. So obviously that leads to the next question. Where did you find Zane? What is his story as a child compared to the role that he plays? So Zain is a Syrian refugee. He's been living in Lebanon uh, for the past eight years in very difficult circumstances because of the situation that refugees, you know, all over the world that are uh, in, in, in hosting countries that are already facing their own economical problems. So it's very difficult for Syrians and for Lebanese people. So. So Zayn has been growing up in very difficult circumstances. He's never been to school. He's been, a, when we started shooting, he was almost 12. And he didn't know how to even write his name, which is only three letters. So Zayn obviously grew up on the streets, uh, even though his parents, what is different from the film is that his parents really loved him. And they were able, in a way, to, um, protect him somehow. But still, he, I mean, the, the streets were, was his life. So he grew up on the streets. So you can imagine the violence that he's seen. You can imagine the, the abuse on the streets. You can imagine um, the violence between those kids, the drugs, the, uh, this, he's, this, this boy has seen a lot and he's been mistreated also. He's, he's heard a lot of um, disrespectful words towards him also. So, 
So when we started casting, the casting process was, was a very wild process also. It was street, street casting. Uh, the, my, my casting recruiters used to go everywhere in Lebanon and to the most difficult places, to the most difficult neighborhoods. And they would interview kids. And they saw Zayn on the street. Uh, he was uh, next to the, uh, in, in the neighborhood where he lives with his friends. He was actually having a fight with uh, friends of his and the casting director saw him and saw that you know uh, personality that he had so she started interviewing him and interviewing him and i usually see all the interviews um, that they do at the end of the week or two two days later and it was obvious to me as soon as i saw zen it was zen and and it's it's amazing now i compare uh, five years ago, when I started this whole process, one day I'm coming back from, from a long day of research because the film needed a lot of research. So I come back from a, a very hard day of research when I saw, where I saw lots of kids in very, very difficult circumstances. And so I come home and I start dr drawing um, the face of a child who is shouting at adults. And he has his mouth wide open and there's adults in front of him and he's shouting with all his heart at them. When I compare, and it was in 2013, and back then I hadn't even met Zane, I hadn't even written those scenes. When I compare this picture, this drawing with Zane, it's exactly Zane. So it's somehow things, I feel sometimes things were meant to be, like the, the pieces of the puzzle come together and you start understanding why you do certain things and what leads you to certain things and why, why, why things sometimes are meant to happen, are meant to be. So I think I was really meant to meet Zane in my life. Well, obviously, <clears throat> faith plays a role here, miracle plays a role, yes. and now I'm going to ask about craft, because it's one thing to find the perfect boy on the street, it's another to coax a performance from someone who's never been in front of a camera. And it would be one thing if Zane's character were primarily the boy we meet who says at the beginning, I stabbed a son of a bitch. In other words, somebody who is capable of fighting and screaming. But his primary identity on the second time I'm watching the film is that of protector. First, he's protecting his sister, Sahar, from being sold off for marriage then he's protecting baby Jonas. Now, to get that kind of caring in a performance, was it primarily through workshops, rehearsals, improvisation? What did you do to get that? No, we never really rehearsed because like you were saying, that first moment is the most precious moment for me. I've never really asked them to act. I just asked them to be who they are. It was impossible for me to explain to Zane how to become somebody else or act uh, in a different way than what he really is. All I did was to really capture who he is and sort of direct it into the fiction that we had already written. And it was a very fine line and it was a choreography actually between reality and the fiction that was written. So it was a very organic way of working with them because Zane is a very wild child. It's not usually the actor is at the service of a certain uh, dialogue or certain text or a certain mise-en-scene or certain way of camera movement or light. In this, uh, in this case, it was the other way. We had to be at his service. So we, we had to know how to become invisible in, or, in order not to really block him or paralyze him. How to be invisible, how to know how to capture that special moment uh, where he's really himself. And, and I was always looking for that moment. For me, it was impossible even to think that Zane is acting. Zane had to be himself in a certain situation. Uh, and so, the secret is to really be very patient and spend a lot of time. So we shot for over six months. We have 500 hours of rushes. 
So it was, you can imagine, we have takes that, that, were, that took over an hour sometimes with my crew, my, 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 my um, uh, cinematographer with the, with, the, with the camera on his shoulders for, for an hour, the, 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 the sound uh, with, with their you know, booms for over an hour. You can imagine how the, 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 the crew was so, um, involved in the process that we were all, I don't know, there was something that, that gave us so much strength because we knew that we were capturing reality. And sometimes, you know, it's crazy things happened on, 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 on the set that, I'll, I don't know, maybe I'll tell you about them later, but we were, sometimes I was really, I had the feeling it was, what we were shooting was actually reality most of the time. But that raises another kind of question. You could have made a cinema verite about a kid, Zane, and a couple of encounters, but this is a well-scripted story that, that has narrative right, momentum. Now, I know this is a kind of hard to answer, but what is the relationship between what we just watched and the screenplay that you presumably began with? It's very, it's very close, but I mean, there's a story that we need to tell at the end of the day. There's a, there's a narrative that you need to tell and you have to be very precise in what you're doing. It, it can't be just an adventure where you don't know where you're gonna land. It was very structured in that way. We knew when we were gonna, where we were gonna start, where we were gonna end. But inside the scene itself, uh, I just gave, uh, I, I was just, waiting for also whatever life was gonna give me. It was not something, it was impossible for me to be very structured or clustered in something that I had written. Of course, there's a written scene and it's very, with dialogues and everything, but I was also very open to whatever life was gonna give me and whatever those actors were gonna give me, whatever improvisation was, was going to happen. So it's really a very fine mixture between both. So in the, fi the film is very similar to what was already written, but also uh, different in the way uh, people actually uh, adapt the, 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 the dialogues to their personality, the way they sometimes talk about themselves in a certain situation. There's a lot of scenes where actually the characters are talking about their own experience in life that is very similar to the experience uh, in life that they should have in the film. So it was also for us, uh, shooting it, very, confu not confusing, but you have this, 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 um, this um, um, awareness that this moment is not actually just another film. This is actually life happening in front of you. So it's, it was always a mixture between both. So it's impossible to just tell you how, how, how the percentage of, of fiction and the percentage of reality. It's really a mixture of both. And it's my way of doing things also. Like there's no recipe. People tell me sometimes, how did you do it? Or how do you actually manage it? It's my own way of doing things. And I find it simple. I find it very organic and comes to me very naturally. This way of, of uh, adapting myself or capturing somebody else's truth and, and navigating it towards a fiction that ha I had already written. And I do it naturally. It's not something that is very complicated. Well, for example, was the name of the boy Zane in the no. screenplay? No. Okay. Actually, no. His, his real name, was his, his name in the script was Yahya. And then when I met Zane, uh, I knew that he's supposed to okay. be Zane because and we know that on most sets, a director says action and cut. Would I be right in assuming that you did not do that? Never, never. So you just basically <laughs> yes. were talking with them yes. and then the cameras Knowing were rolling. The exactly. And then at a certain moment. Exactly. So you, I mean, it was also hell for my editor uh, because <laughs> he, 
because he had to erase my voice all the time, you know, because he had to work with that all the time, because it's, it's exactly it. I'm speaking to them the whole time, during the whole take, just directing them, navigating them towards, and sometimes I go into the scene, into the set, and I come back out, and, and it's very free. It's not really structured, it's not like, um, and, and, and if I feel that I have to shoot uh, that scene uh, three days later, I was, uh, I, I, was, I was doing that. Because also I was very lucky that my husband produced the film. Yes, so. and I <laughs> should mention, you, uh, all right. so I have known me. the name Khaled Musanar ever since I saw the first film, Caramel, yeah. because this gentleman is the composer of all of Nadine Labaki's films. And on this one, he also happens to be co-writer and producer. And for me, husband is a very important title <laughs> as well. Yeah. Actually, if we can raise the light slightly, I know he's with us and I would like to he's acknowledge here. his presence. Can we get a little more light? And that way we could even see who's in, in the hall because <laughs> we can't see anything right now. Can we get more light? Ah, now we've got some light here. Khaled, there you go. <laughs> a gentleman to my far right. <laughs> I know how important it is to have yes. Uh, a supportive, smart husband who helps you in your work. So yeah. I, I know that, uh, and that leads me to a question because here we're talking about how do you structure something that is so anchored in taking the reality of the people you're working with. Two questions really. One is about the narrative structure because you do, you've obviously chosen maybe in post-production to have a flashback structure. We see the trial before we go back to understand how Zayn got there. And second, the music, which for me has a very, very important role in tying together as well as heightening emotion. Could you talk a little about the way those two de decisions, like was the music written during shooting, before or after? Uh, the music was written before, I mean, approximately at the same time because Khaled obviously is always there. Uh, with us when we're writing, so and he composed it at home. So the the music is almost, you know, born when the film is born, uh, almost at the same time. And it's another for me. It's another character of the film. But in this um, particular situation, uh, I think I, I don't want to, you know, talk in his name. But uh, I mean, we change. We we spoke. We we. <laughs> I mean, I'm g I was going to say we spoke a lot about the music, but we actually fought a lot about the music <laughs> because it was a very fine, it was, we had to find the, the, the really the right kind of music because we felt and Khaled felt the same also that when he, when he saw those characters, when we, he saw them in real life, it was actually very difficult to impose a certain, uh, kind of music on their reality. So he, we didn't really want to feel like we were manipulating uh, the reality. And, and it's something we even were doing in everything. Uh, in the uh, decor of the sets, we, we shot in natural places, in the real apartments where those uh, other kids used to live the same, almost the same life. Even, even the writings, the drawings on the walls of the apartments are drawings from other children who used to live in, the, live in those apartments. We shot in real prisons. We shot with people who have almost the same, uh, the same um, situation in real life, the father, the mother, everybody. There's no actors in the film. And we felt that I, I didn't want to interfere as, um, as a filmmaker. I just wanted to capture life the way it was. So Khalid was also in that same situation where he didn't want to feel like he was interfering or he was adding a um, sort of manipulative layer to, what to the reality of what, what was happening. But at the same time, we're making a film. And a film is also, um, you know, gives you hope, makes you dream, gives you emotions. It's not just, we're not just doing another documentary. It's, all, it's a film, it's a fiction. So it was a very, uh, we had to really find the right balance. It was a big, it was a really uh, big issue, the music. But I think we ended up in having something that we're both very happy with. Well, I, for example, very 
early in the film, there's a slow motion scene of the boys smoking in the street or running. And that's where there is the introduction of a lyrical score. And by the way, we watched tonight the opening of, or part of it from Where Do We Go Now? The way that the women are sort of choreographed approaching the cemetery, it's that score, the mournfully vibrant music that keys us into the world of the film. So even though I, I feel the overwhelming reality of the people who populate this movie, I'm constantly aware of the hand of the filmmaker, filmmakers mm -hmm. guiding the entire process. I mean, for example, I mean, this was actually my husband's perception when we saw the film the first time. It ends with a freeze frame of the face of Zane finally smiling. And I didn't know, he, he mentioned this because I wrote my first book ever about Francois Truffaut, whether you were even thinking of the last shot of the 400 Blows, which 400 is a blows. freeze frame of the boy. It actually, yes, reminds me of it. I didn't really think about it when I was shooting it or when I was thinking about the scene when I wrote it. But when I, yeah, I see the similarity, of course, and I see the similarity in a lot of things, you know, that, 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 that personality, the personality of the boy. Uh, you know, when you're working, you don't really analyze what you're doing. I, I mean, I'm not saying everybody's like that, but I'm not somebody who's very analytical. I'm somebody who's more instinctive. And sometimes the film tells me where it should go, and it's something that I, I feel vis visceralement, viscerally. viscerally, I feel it, without really understanding why sometimes I do certain things. And it's really when I start discussing it uh, with, uh, journalists or with certain critics when I start discussing the process and why you start understanding why you do certain things and I think that that's that's um, last shot is not only that it's also engaging you because Zane is looking at you at that moment and is looking at you and smiling at you as a viewer and this is the first time he really looks into the camera and smiles uh, it's like he's engaging. He's telling you, "This so this was my life. Uh, what what do you feel about it? What's gonna what's what's coming next? Well, actually, what's gonna be between you and me? Yeah, the line of your previous film, "Where do we go Where now? Where do we go now? I mean, what a great title for a motion picture and for your work, actually, in general. Now, in the film, Zane sees his parents and Assad as villains. Yes. And I was wondering if you kind of agree with that, or do you see everyone in this film as a victim? Of course, I, I'm, I was in that same situation so many times of not really knowing and not taking a stand. And, and this is what I wanted you to feel as a viewer also, because I was in this situation so many times. I used to, you know, during the... the, the uh, research process. Sometimes I used to, you know, I, I used to go with some social workers that work in those neighborhoods that help those families. I used to go with so many different, had so many different sources for me to get into those houses. And sometimes I would go into a house and I would find a small apartment. I, I don't really call it a house, it's actually a small room. And I would find kids on their own. Kids cold, hungry, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, literally on their own the whole day. You know, eating anything, anything they would find because they were hungry or whatever. And the first reaction, always, all the time, was to judge the mother. How can she do this? How can she leave her kids? And you judge because you think you're a better mom also. I'm, th I'm thinking I'm a better mom. I would never do something like this to my children. And this is my first reaction was to be angry, angry at the mother, angry at the father, angry at the parents in general. Why do they do this? How do they? And I used to wait for the mother to come back because I want to know who she is. And I want to give her a piece of my mind. And I want to ask her questions. So I would wait for the mom or come back later. Or, or so I, I would meet her at some point and we would sit down. And it, every time it would literally take me 10 minutes, 15 minutes to be completely shaken in all my misconceptions and all my judgments because I've never been in her shoes. 
I've never been hungry. My kids have never been hungry. I've never had to give my kids sugar and water because I have nothing else to give them. I've never had to sell my daughter who's 11 or 12 years old because I think maybe she's gonna have a better life there. Maybe at least he's gonna feed her. Or maybe because I wanna feed my other kids. I've never been in, those sh in, in her shoes. So at the end of the day, that's, this is the contradictions that I used to always feel. I was a ro in a roller coaster of emotions the whole time towards everyone, towards the fathers, towards the mothers, towards the family, towards the community, towards the, even the law, towards because this is what we're all victims of a system that is completely failing us and is not giving a chance to anyone to even breathe. So the, 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 the parents are as much of a, of a victim as the kids. And, and I wanted you to feel this. That's why in, we have these scenes in the court where the mother is looking at me and telling me, who do, who do you think you are? You've never fed your... And this is actually a real moment where I told her, her name is Kausa, now you forget everything. I'm not the filmmaker. I'm not now, I'm just the society that, is, that keeps judging you the whole time. And you look at me and you tell me everything you think about me. And this is what she said. And she was not an actress before no, either. Never, no, no. And she lives exactly in that, you know those slums where the camera goes up and you see the slums with the tires? She lives in one of those houses with her kids. And she has, she has a very, very bad, uh, you know, difficult circumstances. Um, so it was, for me, that's, it's impossible to take a decision. It's impossible to take a stand. You're always in these contradictory emotions. You don't know, who's, you know who to blame in, in, this whole, in this whole system, in this whole mess, this whole Capernaum that we live in, this whole right. chaos that we live in. The, yeah. the title of the film, Capernaum, apparently means chaos. We can chaos. ask about this in a yes. second. But what you're saying, I, I've often quoted this here and in my classes at Columbia, Jean Renoir, when he made Rules of the Game, had the most wonderful line playing Octave, there's only one terrible thing in this world, and that is that everybody has his reasons. Yeah, exactly. And once you can somehow exactly. understand and live with that understanding, I think a certain your... wisdom maybe comes in. Absolutely. Now, if I, if I heard this correctly, you have a son who is about the same age as Zane and a daughter who He's is exactly about the, the same, same age, age yeah. as Jonas. <laughs> and I can't help but wonder what effect making this film with these people had on you as not just a filmmaker, but a mother. It was an ongoing struggle the whole time because every time Treasure, her name is Treasure actually, Jonas is a girl in real life. And yes, and her, her name is Treasure. And she was really our treasure in the film. Uh, so every time Treasure would, would come into the set, I would start crying without knowing why. Because I used to see my own daughter in her. And what is even harsher was that at the time that we were shooting those scenes where uh, Treasure is without her mom, she was really without her mom because at that moment, her parents, because they were illegal, illegal migrant workers living in Lebanon, they got caught. And so they went to prison. And they got caught, not only that, they got caught with Rahil, who is, you know, her mother in the film. The three of them got caught together because the three of them were living illegally in Lebanon, no papers, um, uh, invisible people, exactly like in the film. So while we were shooting, they, after the scene where, where we shot, where we, where we filmed Rahil getting caught, two days later, she gets caught in real life. And the father and mother of Treasure get caught with her because they were together at the same party because during the film, they started becoming friends, so they used to go to the same places together. So they get, there's a raid and they get caught together and they go to jail for three weeks. So when we were actually filming those scenes with Treasure, Jonas, without her mom, 
she was actually without her mom in real life. And that's why I, I tell you that sometimes we were even confused. Is this, are we filming reality or are we, is this a film? What is this we're doing? And you don't know why sometimes life puts you in, this situ in these situations. Was it to maybe reinforce what we were doing or giving, give, it, give us even more strength to keep going? It gave us even more strength that what we, we're telling the truth here. She was actually, and, and, and the casting director took her home and she raised her for three weeks and she, we were her family for three weeks. So it was always like this. This, this whole adventure actually changed us all. We're not the same people anymore. <laughs> We're not the same. What do you hope that the effect of this film will be? Besides the obviously individual emotion that many of us feel and take with us. Is there some larger goal? Yes, of course there's a larger goal. That's why the film was made. I mean, I, I felt responsible in a way. And how I felt, re I felt responsible for our inaction, our inactivity, because this is what we usually do, you know. When we're faced with so much uh, hardship and so much suffering, Sometimes we choose to keep going and continue our way because it's too much. We feel small, we don't know, we feel so small that we, you know, it, the, the problem is so big we can't do anything about it. So we just keep going and we completely ignore it. So for me, I really felt responsible in a way. I am responsible for this chaos we are living in by being just silent, by continuing in my car and just going and and not looking at this boy who's standing right in front of my uh, car window, looking at me, and I'm not looking at him, I'm doing this because I don't want him to see me. So what does he feel exactly at that moment? How does it feel to be so ignored? How does it feel to be so invisible? So I wanted to, if I, and I used to think, if I gave this boy a voice, what would he say? What would he tell me? So for me, the, the biggest aim was to make this voice heard, to put a spotlight more on this problem and, and make this voice resonate more. I just wanted him to speak. I wanted him to speak for his right, to, to stand up for his right, to, stay, to say enough. Because, you know, we talk in the names of those children so much. You know, we have all those people talking in the names of the, all these you know, uh, organizations and lawyers and judges and everybody and social workers, everybody's talking in the names of these children. I just wanted to hear what those children has, had to say. And so I, this is, this, I felt this responsibility. I want to make that voice heard. And now what I want, I want to have, I want, I hopefully want to happen is that this film becomes a debate and and that we are actually able to make a change. And this is what we're planning to do in, in Lebanon. This, we're planning to work with the government, we're planning to work with the several ministries, uh, do, uh, organize special screenings, uh, organize round tables, work with the judges, the juvenile ju judges, and just talk and, and listen and see how we can change things. What can we change? How can we, maybe I'm too, Naive, you know, some people tell me you're too naive, nothing's gonna change. But I, I wanna feel like, I, I, wanna, I wanna try. Because I've been so much in, in this for, for the past four or five years. I've seen it very closely, I've seen the failures, I've seen where it's going wrong, and I've, 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 I've heard it from those kids' mouths. They tell me what they go through. They tell me what happens, um, in each step of the way, they explain to me, you know, some kids tell me, and this is why, this is what inspired the whole court scene, the whole, you know, I want to, I want to uh, sue my parents because they gave me life. It was what those kids used to tell me. I used to ask them one question, are you happy to be alive? And most of the times the answer would be no. 
I'm not happy to be alive. I wish I was dead. They use that word, I wish I was dead. I don't know why I was born. I don't know why I'm born if nobody's going to love me, if I'm never going to eat when I'm hungry, if I'm going to be abused, mistreated, if I'm going to be beaten up every day, if I'm never going to hear a nice word. And they even, when they talk about themselves, they use words like I'm an insect, I'm a parasite, I am nothing. You know when Zane is saying life is worse than the shoe I'm wearing, it's not something I, I put in his mouth. I just direct him towards exploding and saying what he feels. But this is what he feels. He feels like he's living in hell. Those kids are actually living in hell. So most of them even don't eat. If you ask them, how old are you? Just exactly like Zane, he said, he, he, they tell you, I challenge you to ask those kids. And they tell you, I don't know, maybe 12, 13, something like that. So you, you don't know your exact date of birth. No, you, nev you don't know when you were born. You've never actually celebrated your birthday, never. So nobody ever blew a candle for you. Nobody ever told you, you are important for me. Your life is important, no. They don't, they don't know, they don't have a sense of even the importance of their being, the sacred nature of their being. They, they don't have any notion of that. For them, they are anything, they're just trash. They're just a chair, they're just, and this is how people treat them. So what is going to happen with those kids? Those kids are gonna grow, are gonna grow up one day and, and we're not talking about hundreds of kids or thousands of kids. We're talking about millions of kids ar across the world who are living in those conditions. And if we don't do anything about it, it's gonna explode in our faces one day. Those kids are gonna grow up and they're growing up very angry at us, the society that ignores them, that does not. You know, the, the United Nations Convention for Children's Rights states that when a child is born, he has to have an identity, he has to have an education, he has to have love, he has to, um, you know, they, they cite all sorts of things. They even talk about a certain, uh, a certain space for the kids to play, the, their playground. Those kids' playground, sometimes, those, ki those kids that you see on the streets begging, their playground is actually half a meter cement block between two roads. And when they are one year old, two years old, I, I see the mothers, I saw once a mother holding her child by the t-shirt. He couldn't move because if he goes this way, he's gonna die because he's gonna get hit by a car. If he goes this way, he's gonna die. So this is his only playground. This is where he's gonna experiment life. This is where he's gonna grow up. This is, he can't even make two steps. So you can imagine, what, what happens to all those charts and all those conventions? Who, who is looking at those charts? Who, what are we doing about them? Are they only just things that we write just to feel you know, more comfortable or, or, or have a, a better conscience when we sleep? I, I, don't, I don't know. What are we doing about those things? Well, I mean, obviously, this could be a whole other discussion on a political level, but what I'm struck with is the way your images present something. Like, I first see the baby sister, is it, of um, Zane yes. with a, a, an chain. ankle chain, a, 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 chain. a chain around the ankle. And then later, that's kind of visually rhymed when Jonas is left with the rope. See, it's that kind of poetic detail in storytelling that elevates something from a news item in a newspaper to in motion picture. And it's usually the latter, the movie, that can have an impact because we take that with us. We, we live that story as opposed to reading a statistic. Exactly. Oh dear, I just realized. It humanizes the problem. It humanizes, it gives it a face. Instead, because of course you hear about it in the, in the news, but like you're saying, you're seeing it as statistics, as numbers. You don't really relate. But when you're watching it in a film, you're actually humanizing it. You're putting a face to the problem. And here it's, it's the face of a, of a struggling boy. So you, you cannot but identify and, and, it, and, and it, it impacts you in a different way. 
We have only a little bit of time, a few minutes for questions. I see someone in the back, and I will repeat the question. Yes? Did you consider naming the movie Zane? Yes. <laughs> we considered, uh, yes, this was one of the other uh, uh, options that we had. But it was naming it uh, Capernaum was something very symbolic for me. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, it was actually, it was a word that I used to use when I was a kid in school, especially in French and in Arabic. Uh, to signify chaos. And if you look it up in the dictionary, it says it's a place where a lot of things are stacked on top of each other in a disorderly manner. So when I was a child, to impress my, my, my teacher, especially my French teacher, I used to you know, sometimes look for other words that meant things that felt a little bit more you know, poetic or more savant, I don't know how you say it, you know, more... Wise. Yes, yes, and so, so it was more sophisticated. So this is a word I used to use a lot when I was a kid. So when we were writing the film, and at, you know, even before we started writing, and, and I was all over the place. We, I, I, you know, because all those problems are so intertwined. You cannot talk about children working without talking about paperless children, without talking about the, the absurdity of having, to, to having a, a paper to prove that you exist when you're really here in, f in your own flesh and blood, but you have to have this paper to prove your existence, the absurdity of, of borders, the, the refugee crisis, the, you know, all of this was so intertwined together. So sometimes you don't know where to start and how to start. And, and Khaled was, of course, with us during that whole process. So he said, okay, Nadine, you're going all over the place. So why don't you talk? And I start talking and talking. And he starts writing on the board all those themes. <laughs> and at one point, I look at the board and I go, but this is, c'est un cafarnaum. It's a... It's chaos. We're living in chaos. And, and that's how the title started even before we, we the, the title came up even before we started writing the film. So that's why for me it was very symbolic, even though I knew that some people will not understand what it means because it's not very common. So Zayn was uh, another option that we thought of, but we, we went to the origins and then we went back to the, you know, to the, so the original title. Okay, in the first row and then on the aisle in the back. Uh, am I correct when I say that you said that Zayn is in the way understood? Yes. So Z therefore, my assumption is that you know how to read. No. Z if Zayn never went to school, he doesn't know how to read? So you now have a script where you have a dialogue. How does the Dutchman begin with the script and the dialogue? So how does a script with dialogue get to Zayn? I never gave any of my actors the dialogues, never. It was, it, it's a, it's a diff, completely different process where I explain to them what they need to say very generally. Of course, I, I sometimes would read them the dialogue so they have it in their head, but I never really ask them to recite the dialogues exactly like it was written. Uh, because I, 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 they need to, because they don't have the process of an actor, so it's impossible. It would, it would look too fake for them to be repeating a text that I had written. So I was always explaining to them the situation and they, where they need to go and what they need to say approximately, and then they sort of say it in their own words. But it's never like a written script that they need to memorize and say it exactly the way it was written. It was very, very free. Uh, on the aisle in the back, uh, yes, the woman in red, and then all the way in the back will be the last one.
Thank you. The question is, uh, are we in this film meant to be blaming the poor for being poor when in fact you are also suggesting all the other reasons for the problems, including government? I think the absence of government, uh, cont uh, contrary to what you're saying, is in every frame of the film. You, you, I mean, we don't really have to say it in order to, to understand it. It's in every single frame of the film. In all those places that we're shooting in, all those prisons that we're shooting in, the fact that even people don't even look at those children uh, when they are left alone on the streets, the way at the end you see those files that are being stacked on top of each other and Zane's file is thrown in the middle of it. I mean, the failure of the system is everywhere in the film. The way those kids are left alone on those streets, the way those kids are never admitted in a school because they don't have papers, the way that Sahar died uh, in front of uh, the hospital because she doesn't have a paper, that's why she wasn't admitted. I think the failure of the system is everywhere in the film. And, and it would be unfair to say we're only blaming the parents because in the film you're always in this roller coaster of emotions where you know that they're also victims of this failing system. And it's what the film is saying. I mean, Zane, of course, is saying this is the only thing he knows. I just don't want to be born. I don't want my brother or my sister to have the same fate as I had. But he's not saying it's because of my parents. He's, he's, just, he's just shouting out his anger, and it's really, it's because of us all. It's because of what we're doing to those kids that these kids are end up ending up, because the parents are, are, are as much a victim as, as he is. It's really his way of, of formulating his anger by saying, I don't want to be born in your world. Don't have any more children if you can't really be up to the responsibility. And it's really something that he's blaming us all for that. We are all to blame for that. But I don't agree that you don't, I mean, it's in every frame that the government is absent and the system is failing and you don't really have to say it in order to. There is a question all the way in the back, straight ahead, yes? Uh, I was just wondering what happened to Zane the person? You know? What happened to Zane the person? A very nice story is happening to Zane, the person, because uh, he was uh, resettled with all his family in Norway. The UNHCR, the, the High Commissioner uh, for Refugees, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, um, helped us, and, uh, and Zane was resettled in, in Norway a few months ago. And he is now going to school, and he's learning how to read and write. And, and he has an amazing house overlooking the sea. He has a bed, he's sleeping on a bed. He's never slept on a bed uh, until he was 14. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, he, he, you know, he was supposed to be here tonight, but he arrives at 10.45. You no, know, so now he should, be, he should be on his way. Yeah, we were originally yes. going to have this little surprise of bringing him on yes. stage. And he's coming in because Sony Classics, which is going to be distributing this film in mid-December, has mounted a campaign. Um, this film is the official entry, as I said, from Lebanon for the best foreign language film Oscar. But also... <laughs> because my husband Mark is on the SAG nominating committee, I get to see all these invitations, and I saw the one for SAG. They're presenting him as a potential nominee for best actor in a leading yeah. role. <laughs> so um, Zane's life has obviously changed a great deal yes. since you found him on the street. Um, I know there are some more questions, but <laughs> Nadine Lavaki and Khalid Musanar came in at five o'clock this morning and haven't slept, and tomorrow they start this whirlwind of promotional activity. I just want to say at the end how grateful we are, partly because from the chaos that is your title, 
you have obviously crafted not only order but meaning and from people who have been clearly invisible within their own country and globally, you have given face and voice in such a way that these are no longer strangers to us and give us a responsibility to try not to be so indifferent to the sufferings in this world. And for that, we can only say thank you for the film and thank you for joining us.